Cheryl, there, there's a couple of Cheryl Hunters on here. You're, you've <laughs> multiplied. Love it. Really? <laughs> Someone zoomed in as me? Yeah. All right. Okay, I think we're all sorted out. Mark, are you ready to get started? Um, yes, I am. Cool. All right, Let's do it. Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for being here and your patience as we got get things going, but we are online, excited to get to our book club. Um, today's book is Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World, but we'll get into that and our book club host in a second. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Mark Gordon, the managing editor of the Business Observer. Um, wanted to take a few minutes to introduce some of my Observer Media Group colleagues. Um, Kat Hughes, who helped get us on, she is the executive editor of the Business Observer. And we also have Louis Lavio is on here, I believe, our Tampa Bay editor. Hi, Louis. Amanda Postma, our Sarasota Manatee staff writer. I saw her somewhere. Kevin McQuaid, our commercial real estate editor. And Diane Schaefer, associate publisher. I saw her. And Robin Langton as well, head of marketing, who is like the backbone to all of this. So thank you, Robin, for all that you do to get this up and going. Um, so again, thanks for coming on our book club. Uh, I recognize some other people. Hi, Jenny Townsend. Good to see you. Um, books about leadership and business have been important to many of us. So with this book club, we are exploring some of the best books about business and leadership through discussions by some of the top area business professionals and leaders. And as I mentioned, today's book is Range, um, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. And for me personally, one of the things that I get out of this is I learn about new books. Um, and then I'm like, how did I not know that that book existed? Um, so kudos and thank you to Cheryl for turning me, Cheryl Hunter for turning me on to that book. Um, I'll introduce Cheryl in a second. Uh, one of housekeeping notes, this event is being recorded and it'll be available to you later on. Um, and I see our slides are up there. We're gonna thank our sponsors. Um, Kirkering Barbario, Sarasota's premier CPA firm, providing a variety of tax, audit, and accounting services to businesses and individuals. Sarasota Chamber, a bridge that links businesses, organizations, and residents with innovative programs that strengthen Sarasota's economic vitality and quality of life. And Williams Parker Attorneys at Law, committed to client service to community and devotion to excellence in the practice of law guiding principles for nearly 100 years. Um, so real quick, also, um, please mute your microphone if it isn't already muted. If you have a comment or question during the discussion of the book, you can unmute yourself. Um, and Cheryl is gonna be calling on people as well. Um, and if your name is showing up as somebody else, Cheryl Hunter, Robin Langton, Mark Gordon, it wouldn't be me, but um, you can change it to your own name. Um, so we know who you are. So just give a real quick introduction of Cheryl and then I'll shut up and let her go on and, and handle this. Um, Cheryl is the president of Hunter Business Law, the entrepreneur's law firm in Tampa. Uh, it made the 2019 and 2020 Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing companies in the US and the 2019 and 2020 list of largest women owned businesses in Tampa Bay. For over 20 years, Cheryl has worked with growth-focused entrepreneurs and their business enterprises from startup to exit. She also represents VC funds, including Florida Funders and Tampa Bay Dot Ventures and individual angel investors. The firm services include private security offerings, M&A, IP protection, and other business law services. And I'll just say I've known Cheryl for quite some time, and I've written about some of her clients and we wrote a story about her several years ago, and I always come away from a conversation with Cheryl feeling smarter um, and, and wiser, so I'm excited that she agreed to do this. In fact, when I emailed her, are you up for this, she wrote back like right away, book club, you had me at book club, and um, I'm just as excited as, as she are, so thank you again. Cheryl, why don't you take it from here? 
Hi, welcome everyone. Yes, I've always been a great lover of books. And so the opportunity to speak to a group of book lovers, people who are lifelong learners, curious minds, and uh, enjoy sharing ideas and concepts, uh, that always speaks to me. So yes, we're here to talk about range, the gen why generalist triumph in a specialized world by David Epstein. It is a a compelling book. Um, there are incredible stories well researched, and so I'm super excited to dive in and talk with you all about it. And I'm going to call on. I know that I know some of the faces in the group, so I'm going to I'm going to pick on you because it's really important that we have engagement. That's really why we're coming here together is to learn from each other, not only from reading this book and. I think if you haven't had a chance to read this book, there's still a great deal to be thought about and that will come out of just the conversations that we're gonna have here together. So I wanted to start off by reading uh, my favorite poem that I have hanging in my office um, that has long been a friend of mine by Robert Frost called The Road Less Traveled. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but I wanted to start the discussion of today's book because I feel that it has the the pace of the book and the sort of the personality of the book is, is somewhat captured by this uh, long held love poem of mine. <laughs> so uh, the road less traveled, two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first one for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. I read this as a, a young girl, and I've always loved it, and I think um, it really speaks to the generalist in me, and um, if many of you have entrepreneurial spirits, uh, curious minds, I'm sure you relate to sort of the woeful aspects of we have what, but one life to live. And there are many times where you come to that fork in the road and you're compelled to think to yourself, which way am I going to go here? Uh, and you have to make a choice sometimes. And yet I think you can circle back and I think you can go around and around. And the beauty of this book is it kind of supports people like myself who have taken maybe a little bit of a divergent path to get to where they ended up. Um, and I, I personally can share that uh, without getting too, too long now that it's been 25 years of professional life. Um, but I started off at a big firm, uh, graduated from Georgetown Law School and, and went to a large firm. And I just didn't feel like that was my place for one, one reason or another, it just didn't feel right. Went to a smaller firm, litigation firm, and um, did that for a couple of years because I had it was an elder law area and I had a passion for working with the elderly. That was always in my heart and decided, though, that that didn't feel quite right either. So I was exploring these different things um, as I was on my own path. And I ended up starting my own firm, really developed a passion for business and law, ended up in-house counsel for a real estate developer and did that for a number of years. I ended up having an online education company back to my passion for the elderly. It was uh, with long-term uh, care companies and home health care companies doing education for them. And then now I'm doing the entrepreneur's law firm because it allows me to work with people with all sorts of diverse backgrounds, doing exciting businesses, and really speaks to my passion to constantly learning through exposure to uh, individuals who are, are doing very compelling, new, innovative things every single day. So that's a little bit of my journey and partly probably why I was attracted to this book. I'm also attracted to it as a parent. Uh, my children are 18 and 16. Many of you probably have young children uh, that you're thinking about 
how you raise them and what you teach them. And the concept in this book around specialization versus generalist, you're thinking about what kind of sports to put your children in and should you have them focus on one musical instrument or a diverse number of instruments, um, this book can really help you think about those subjects as well. Uh, by a show of hands, those of you who are on video, how many of you just naturally are inclined to think about yourselves more as generalists or more as someone who with hyper-specialization uh, and deep depth in one subject matter? So we'll start with generalist. Generalist. Who's a generalist? Most people are raising their hand. How about a specialist? Someone with deep specialization in medicine or law, or uh, any kind of developer skills. That's interesting. So, um, one of the things that came out in in this book was the concept of. Um, you know, maybe you go to specialists to ask specific facts, to learn specific things that you need to know, and you go to generalists for opinions. I thought that that was an interesting concept um, of maybe the type of specialists that we're looking for. Uh, going back to the book itself, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with David Epstein's work. This book was written in 2019. He was previously a science and investigative reporter for ProPublica, and prior to that, a senior writer at Sports Illustrated. And so a lot of his uh, leading to the question that he poses in this book came from studying athletes and their, the excellence and how they would reach the skill sets that they, they had in their careers. Uh, and the question, when you get to the end of the book range, he says that the question I set out to explore was how to capture and cultivate the power of breadth, diverse experience, and interdisciplinary exploration with systems that increasingly demand hyper-specialization and would have you decide what you should do before first figuring out who you are. So I'm going to think about uh, our own lives and how we evolved and how we became who we were you might be able to go back and look at were you ever asked to specialize or focus on a certain area before you were really certain what it is that you wanted to do with your life. So I'm going to call on one person at a time here to kind of ask, you know, whether you, you had a point in your life where you switched gears, where you thought you were down one path and decided, I want to make a career change. This is actually not what I'm interested in doing anymore. So Renee Brandon, can I unmute you and see if you had a, a, maybe a long career in something that, that you changed over time? Gosh, I, 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 I wish you hadn't have selected me number one. Uh, however, let me rise to the occasion. Um, um, the session today, uh, appeal to me because of the subject matter. The, the, uh, the book talks about generalization uh, as being, or general skills, as opposed to specific skills. And um, I, I, when I realized I was interested in uh, this subject, because it's really the first time somebody has brought it to my attention this way, uh, although I've experienced it personally from my own career, uh, because I started working when I was 16 and I won't bore you with the evolutionary details of, of my background. I'm now, um, I've now been in business for over 50 years. And what I evolved from and what I ended up uh, being uh, was quite different. I started off in the advertising business, uh, selling advertising space in Australia when I was 18 years of age. And I ultimately ended up working for large companies in senior management capacities, running large divisions. And then ultimately, uh, bought a business which I grew um, and what I came to understand having moved from industry to industry is that business is business the principles of running a good business are the same number one number two there are very few people really who have the overall general qualifications 
of running those businesses. And the mistake so many businesses make, uh, be it uh, privately owned businesses or public companies, is, um, is promoting people who don't have generalist skills, they have very specific skills, and uh, those specific skills may be uh, true for that particular vertical or that particular market or that particular business or that particular industry, but the much larger task is really running the overall business mm -hmm. and all of the elements that go into running the overall business. So, um, so that is what uh, struck me about the session today to hear what everyone had to say about it, because I've certainly found it to be true. Number one, number two, because I'm in the business of buying and selling um, businesses with, with buyers and sellers, uh, main street businesses predominantly, is that uh, I frequently, and this is where I am different from a lot of other uh, M&A and, and business brokers, is that um, I, I really try to understand the skill set of the buyer or the seller uh, so that I can better help the transaction. And also to provide some advice to the buyer in terms of whether or not he's really suitable for that particular acquisition. So uh, I don't know whether or not that helps you. Um, the other thing which I found interesting was that, why is it that uh, it appealed to you, Cheryl, because you're a lawyer, um, and I won't hold that against you, by the way. <laughs> Thank um, you. Uh, because lawyers are part of our, uh, you know, we deal with lawyers all the time and accountants all the time. Um, but uh, when I when I saw that you were sort of hosting this session, uh, I thought, well, what is it that appealed to you that you could apply to what you're doing in your law practice? Because mm -hmm. you must encounter a great number of entrepreneurs, uh, investors, buyers and sellers of businesses. Um, and so something must have something must have occurred to you um, over a period of time as, as to why that was so. Yeah, actually, I thank you for that question and also for that background. Um, my personal attraction to it is a little bit of I, I consider myself to be unusual in the sense that I enjoy what I'm doing at, on a broad level, like a 360 degree view of businesses. And I'm not a deep specialist in any one area. In fact, um, Hunter Business Law markets itself as general counsel to growth-focused entrepreneurial companies. And what I mean by that is we, we do have to have a broad view and business acumen uh, as lawyers because we are kind of interacting with our clients as they're almost on their management team and part of their business as opposed to just doing a, a coming in on a transactional basis and just seeing a piece of something and advising and then leaving, we really try to understand the full complexity of the company and where they're trying to head in order to do an effective blending of legal and business counsel. So we certainly, for a good example would be, there are certain very specific employment laws um, that come into play from time to time. That might be ADA compliance, a sexual harassment claim, those are highly specialized legal issues. And I would go outside to an employment lawyer with deep expertise, or if there's a data breach, there might be an, attor an attorney that has a very specialized area of exactly how you have to respond and comply with the statutes on the data breach. That's a different animal than the kind of um, partnership that we have with our clients to help them propel from startup all the way through to an M&A transaction like what you're doing. And when you're going through an M&A transaction, you also have to have a broad understanding of um, the company's operations from intellectual property to uh, contracts, to liability issues that they've faced. Um, and so I always tell the people and I hire personally for our firm, really strong issue spotters, because my thought process is if you can identify the issues, you can go find the answers. And that's where you can bring in specialists on an as-needed basis. But if you don't have a 360 degree view and you don't have a broad base of knowledge, you're really going to miss the issues themselves. And that's where a bigger problem can arise. So it definitely has impacted the way I've 
built our firm, um, knowing that we're taking that general counsel approach. To your point, Renee, on um, M&A transactions, so many of our clients do get to the point where they end up wanting to sell their business because they don't have that next path of CEO skills, that next They are like startup people. They like the early stages. They want to start and grow and create. And then when it becomes a bigger animal and a fully operational corporation, and it feels like a corporation to them, it doesn't feel like their place anymore. It's not like they couldn't maybe get through it and do it, but that's not their natural uh, inclination to continue operations of of a company once they've gotten it to a certain point. So those are our serial entrepreneur clients. And you can kind of tell when they're getting to that point where they're like, it's time for me to exit and go start and do do this all over again. So I think that's an interesting thought process about what does it really take to lead a company? And I'm going to put a client of mine on the spot because I know he's here and I appreciate it. So Rob Hessel, he is the founder and CEO of Source One Solutions. And Source One Solutions is a um, managed IT services and outsourcing design company. They they work with enterprises all over the world. And so he is actually visiting, I think, from Ireland, tuning in from Ireland. Hopefully he's still on. There he is. Yeah. So um, one of the things I I think, um, Rob, you've kind of gone through, you've been an entrepreneur, you've now reached a level in your business and you've got different challenges now, right? As at the size and scale that you've reached as opposed to when you were earlier in your business. Um, I wanted to ask you about that as well as working on an international platform and how that changes maybe the kind of skill sets or cultural uh, challenges that you have with your team. Well, to the, the first question, I guess more around the growth and how, how the change is, as I can relate to everything that you just said, I think you know that very well since you uh, are so close to the company with us. But um, yeah, I can I can see where there's people that want to just do the startup space because the company changes so much as it grows and the job is so different. And I think one of the reasons, I think I probably fit that first first scenario where, oh my gosh, this has gotten big enough, I want out. Um, I had enough good people around me that taught me that's when I actually need to step back a little bit. And I hired a president of the company who is a great operator because I am not a great operator for the size of the, the company now. I, I wouldn't even want that job. So um, I, I, can, I can relate to that piece of it. And the international piece, um, what that actually has taught me a couple of things was, number one, is you, you can't just walk into somebody's office next door and get a read on what's going on. So you have to become very much more analytical and be able to manage by numbers and by data. And the other part is, I think we have employees, full-time employees in 17 countries now. So we deal with a lot of different cultural things. So not just employees, but our, our customers. So having to learn um, and, and be able to take a step back so that things don't operate the way that we're used to in, in North America. Um, for, for example, um, in India, emails are very short, very direct. They almost come across rude. And so the natural response would be to be like, oh, this guy, this guy's, you know, this isn't even half the story. And you get a little bit fired up and you're ready for a confrontation when you get on the phone and they're happy as can be on the other end. Uh, Mr. Robert, how are you today? And they're not even upset. It's just a different way of communicating. And so Mm -hmm. same thing with Latin America. Tuesday means Thursday-ish, depending on if there's some good football matches going on that week or carnival or any of these other things. So you have to learn the difference with with the cultures. And, um, you know, that's a a challenge in itself as well. Yeah, I think one of of the stories was actually in a, a book by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers, which is where the range book was kind of considered to challenge some concepts from the book Outlier, which there's really was just one primary chapter um, called, that was basically taking the premise that it takes 10,000 hours to become a deep specialist in a certain area, whether that's a sports or medicine or some other skill set. And so a lot of um, the articles about range kind of said it was it was challenging the viewpoints of the 10,000 hours. I don't really think it was because I do think it takes 
a long number of hours to be a specialist in something, it doesn't take away from the fact that you do, you know, benefit. If you want to be a specialist, you've got to put the time in and the skills in and practice and learn and read and study that area. But what it did, that book has some very interesting stories as well. It's written in a similar context. And one of the articles was, or one of the stories was about a plane that went down that really didn't need to go down because had the co-pilot who could tell something was going on, had he brought this more aggressively to the attention of the pilot, they probably could have averted disaster. But he was so deferential because he was from Colombia. And when they did research, Colombia has more of a hierarchy and a deference. And so he didn't want to challenge the pilot in a way that maybe an American who's on a low deferential, a low hierarchy, we're all equal mentality, would have challenged that. I bring that up because when you're dealing with people from all walks of life, all levels of your company, I think one of the takeaways for me on this book was that you need to listen from the bottom up and not the top down. The ideas can come from all walks of life, all sectors within your company. And the most important aspect of that is to, there's no dumb questions. You have to have a culture of welcoming being challenged, welcoming your troops to say to you, I think this is a terrible idea. And if you, if you rule and lead by intimidation, nobody's going to do that. They're all going to be quiet in the face of that flight that's about to go down because they, they just don't have a culture where they're invited to do this. And some of the quotes that I found that I thought were interesting that support sort of this concept, let's find it here, um, go to this point. And it, okay, here's one from Elon Musk. You want to be extra rigorous about making the best possible thing you can. Find everything that is wrong with it and fix it. Seek negative feedback, particularly from friends. And then another one from John Wooden. Whatever you do in life, surround yourself with smart people who will argue with you. And so I think when we are taking this away from this book, um, part of it is yourself being a generalist, but also surrounding your culture. Y'all are in businesses. Surround yourself with diverse viewpoints, diversity of ideas, people who, who have different backgrounds. You can kind of get the benefit of generalism by having numbers and people with different backgrounds and cultural backgrounds. And so like for Rob, if, if you're not used to doing business in Australia, or in a certain country, you kind of want to go to those people who have that skill set and let them weigh in on these decisions. But there were numerous stories, illustrative stories in range about like the Columbia disaster, um, the, you know, how sad that was, and that had they listened to some lower level engineers, that might also have been diverted. So I think that it impressed, impressed upon me that we, we need to create less hierarchy and more openness and communication within our own businesses. So I'd actually be, um, let's see, who do we have I can pick on that might comment on the importance. Um, Diane Schaefer, do you have any thoughts on like the importance of uh, diversity of ideas, uh, either in a boardroom or in the business or at meetings? You're on mute. I don't know if you can unmute there. yourself. There yeah. you go. Um, those were all great points that you made. Um, yeah, I think we need to be open to all points of view and, and I guess be aware enough to realize when we're, we're not knowledgeable in a certain area and to, to seek out expertise. I don't know what, what kind of business are you in, Diane? I'm, I work with the Business Observer and I do advertising oh. Okay, great. Well, so you have, when you're in journalism, it's all about finding diverse viewpoints, right? And so hopefully that gets cultivated within your own industry as well. For sure. How about some, anybody here who um, has a business, raise your hand, where you have actually maybe created uh, or gotten rid of a hierarchical structure 
and what they call like a flat organization, or maybe you're a coach and have done that with other people. Any raising of hands, anyone I can call on? Uh, sure, sure. My name is Brian. Uh, yeah, sure. Not exactly answering that question, but um, it seems like my analogies come from either military or sports or finance. So, uh, grew up in an army family, and the military does definitely doesn't do everything right. But one thing they do is when they're having discussions about objectives and plans and things like that, is they start at the lowest lowest ranking person in the room, and they make sure that you're expected to have something thoughtful and productive to say. So everybody starts from the lowest ranking going up to the highest ranking. And then the highest ranking person is supposed to absorb everything and make it a culture where people are collaborating and, and not afraid to say what they think. So it's very intentional. Then. They, they literally require you to answer and to participate in the discussion. Yeah. And I've, I've worked in a bigger organization where that, that definitely wasn't the feeling where the, mm -hmm the branches of the corporation didn't feel like they had as much to say or input when they, when they wanted. So I, I saw both sides. Yeah. I think that definitely is a risk as you get bigger, especially companies will have silos and they're not speaking to each other. And then they're very unclear about why there's a breakdown in their operations. Things are not running smoothly. And it's because this group doesn't know what this group, um, I'm curious too, if any of you have done like cross training within your businesses, like have you had employees who go and, you know, actually do somebody else's job for a day? Jenny, you are, you are shaking your head, maybe for other reasons, but <laughs> can I call on you to see if you've done some cross training? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I own a music school here in Sarasota. So most recently from reading another book, which I'm going to go grab and I'll drop in here, um, creating a leadership team within our organization that incorporates our instructors, our front office, and our executive team as well. So the individuals that are doing sales are working really closely with our instructors. And most recently, I was the one that was like kind of telling everyone, okay, this is a social media plan, but now I actually have them all working together and creating that social media plan to where they can capture videos, information from each other. I've actually worked myself out of a job because of just changing that structure and making sure everybody's working in tandem or cross-training individuals within our organization. Yeah, I think uh, had, there's also a number of stories and range that support that, you know, there might be the specialists or experts or people that you think should know the answer. And if over a number of years or frankly, even months, they can't seem to get to a solution, go way outside of that, you know, that little pool that you're focused on. And, and I know that there are a number of larger companies that do feel that they've lost that innovative skill because they've gotten so corporate and so large. And so, you know, this concept of entrepreneurship has has come up where you have to try to consciously create a spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation within your business. Now, hopefully you don't have to segregate that and that can right. be more of a culture, but for a company that's maybe found itself uh, losing some of those skills of innovation and staying cutting edge and questioning things and continuously improving, if you slow that down, it might need that jump starting of creating like a, almost a, a very intentional, purposeful contest or a group that is there to challenge itself to come to another level and, and to come up with better ideas or be more innovative. Um, I know that um, Israel is a place where very innovative, very entrepreneurial number of companies there. And there are Com large companies like Google that you think, oh, wow, they're so embedded. Why would they need to do this? They actually work with these startups in Israel and other parts of the world in order to, because they know it's just so hard to duplicate the, the culture of a startup and to like kind of create that environment. It just becomes challenging. So you have to kind of challenge yourself as a business owner if you feel like you're stagnant with our fast moving you know, world that we're in right now um, to figure out how to, how to break out of the mold. Uh, and having generalists can probably help with that because they, they kind of come up with new ideas and insights. Um, yeah, please. 
So I, I'm glad Jenny, you spoke. I stick with Jenny because um, I know her business because I've written about it. And my son has also attended her camps and, and lessons um, playing guitar. Mm -hmm. Jenny, I, I think what's so impressive what you've done, I think what 65, six years now with Music Compound is you're full of generalists, right? You have musicians that then go teach certain instruments and they all know how to sort of handle themselves around various age groups of kids, which is not easy. How have you, I, I know you've worked really hard on your staff over the years because we've talked about it, but how have you cultivated a staff full of generalists? So I really empower all of our instructors to really do what they do best, which is teach, and they can all bring their own skill sets. We don't have a basic curriculum. Everyone has the freedom to conduct business as they see fit for each individual person. Uh, I don't micromanage my team at all, and we have incorporated uh, various educational segments for our teachers. So for instance, we have a teacher workshop every single month where it's instructors leading in a workshop for instructors. They're all on the same level. They're all learning together and they're growing together where it's not who's a better teacher and who's doing this. They can actually use each other to grow within um, the organization. And same thing on my front office team. Um, so we have an amazing culture, but I really think it just comes down to, we enjoy what we do. We're passionate about our work and everyone has the freedom to be creative and to grow. And we're very, very supportive. Uh, we focus on love languages. We focus on mental health. Um, so things that are really, really important to my staff individually, um, we bring into the organization as a whole. Yeah. Do most of your students, Jenny, take uh, focus on one instrument as young people or do they tend to try different instruments? Uh, they try different instruments. We have a variety of different programs that allows them to do that. Uh, our parents do pay the membership fees. However, we tell our parents the student needs to play the instrument that they want to play. At the end of the day, if you want <laughs> children to have music in their life forever, then allow them to pick the instrument so they're more inclined to play the instrument at home. And we allow the students to work on the music that they want, so whether it's Taylor Swift, whether it's um, 21 Pilots, whatever that would be, um, that's what we really focus on. So we've really have taken all the rules, broke them. And if you want a certain method or you want a certain approach, I will give you the number to a competitor. Interesting. Yeah. So what you're doing would be more consistent than with the advice and the findings that David Epstein is writing about that um, you can maybe like this focus on head start, like you have to become an expert in this before, you know, at such a young age in, in order to actually stay ahead on what the research that at least he's writing about has found that there might be initial gains, particularly in a career, those first several years, you might be ahead of your peers if you have highly specialized. But when, when they're looking at the full career and the full accomplishments that people have, um, the research that he's pointing to of top performers, whether those are athletes or um, inventors, Nobel laureates, those are people who were much more diverse and arguably were dabbling in things and kind of wayward and um, wondering, you know, why are they doing this now? Um, but many of, this, of the impressive discoveries or concepts that they, would, they came, on, uh, came up with and ended up propelling them into tremendous success were through uh, connecting of the dots over time. And, I, and certainly um, Steve Jobs is one who speaks regularly about sort of, you know, looking back on your life, you can see how the dots connected. Uh, you may not realize at the time like why you're doing what you're doing or where it's going to take you. Uh, and, and they look like um, kind of a winding road. Um, I'm trying to find the quote from him because you, you're probably familiar with it, but it's, it certainly speaks to this issue. I'll probably find it when I'm not looking for it. But um, I also saw that Dean Akers is on, so he is muted, but um, I wanted to call on you, Dean. He is a sales and leadership expert, um, a company called Adjunct CEO. And I had the pleasure of being on his podcast and he's interviewed hundreds of C-suite executives. So I'm not seeing him unmute. So maybe he's uh, not paying attention. I'm going to embarrass him. But um, he certainly, I was interested in his thoughts on C-suite executives and leaders um, and what he has seen in terms of their generalization or generalist versus specialist balance. So 
I'll come back to you, Dean, if you pipe up with that fabulous voice of yours. That, uh, it's got so much energy to it. Um, so I want to go back to another takeaway and see if I can uh, get folks to talk about it. This one really hit me. Uh, <laughs> I tend to be a little too hyper focused on productivity, and I, I, every day I gotta suck suck everything out of every day. And that tends to not give me enough balance in my life, but I, that's just kind of my type A personality. Um, one of the things that uh, David Epstein uses a phrase: you should actively cultivate inefficiency. So another way of putting that was maybe playtime. Uh, so I was interested if any of you have. Uh, anything you do in your work environments to try to cultivate create creativity by doing things as as your team um, or coming up with activities or during meetings where you try to cultivate inefficiency for lack of that. well that's the way he puts it so how about you Lewis do you cultivate inefficiency <laughs> calling you tell us about Tell us a little bit about what you do so that we have context. Well, I'm a journalist, so there's a lot of inefficiency in my day. <laughs> uh, it's called research. Um, it's funny, yeah. I, I was just talking to Mark the other day about a, a quote that I'd seen from Malcolm Gladwell that says, I am free of the burden of expertise. As a journalist, we get, you know, we are not, we're, we're generalist by design, so. Right, that's so, funny. That's um, how about you, Greer Ferguson? Um, yeah, so I think, um, and I used to be a journalist, I was with the Business Observer until recently, so um, probably similar answer to, to Lewis, um, but I'm um, a more general communications person now, um, I'm not super into inefficiency, uh, <laughs> I use a lot of timers and spreadsheets and post-it notes and I probably could benefit from that more. Of, That's of kind that. of a funny word as I think about it more, you know, inefficiency, if you, if you believe in his premise, you wouldn't think it is inefficient because you would think it was more of an investment, right? Because if you're going to get an ROI from being a generalist, then none of that time is wasted. It's all just time that you have to sit back and think. And I do think for problem solving, there is a tendency to try to dive in and answer and solve a problem too quickly, where if you took a step back and really spent time thinking about the problem, like I, I try to do that when we're gonna be coming up with a solution or drafting a contract for a client, or if there's a dispute and you're trying to resolve it, rather than just diving in, taking a step back and really thinking through what is it, the challenge here? What is the landscape that I'm dealing with and the different ingredients and, and sort of processing your mind before you dive into something? And that would be a good place to get the viewpoints and opinions of other members of your team that you may not be thinking about all of the options. But that, that takes discipline and accepting the fact that you're not going to get it done maybe as quickly because you're taking time to think it through, but if you lay that foundation, it's a little bit like, you know, making sure that you, you go to the architect and you get the building foundation, <laughs> figure it out properly before you just dive in. And I think that's true of a lot of projects for business owners. I did find the J Steve Jobs quote, so I'm just gonna read it. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots somehow connect in your future. And that's Steve Jobs. And I think one of the famous stories about him was that um, the, the brilliant fonts that he uses for, for Apple, for the Mac, really came from taking a, a random calligraphy class that he kind of happened upon in college. And um, so the sort of the liberal arts teaching philosophy would support this position too, of that you really have to take in this knowledge in order to um, have a good foundation for a life of, of learning and introspection. So, hey Cheryl, could you go back yeah. to the inefficiency um, concept? As yeah. far as, um, could you explain how you think of that as far as problem solving or even approaching your day in general? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, do you take time to daydream and to be creative? I will say from, for me, uh, 
I can get very deep in the woods, very long days doing work that has to get done for clients. And, you know, that, that very famous phrase, of you, you got to work on the business, not in the business, um, you know, and as a leader trying to grow my law firm, I mean, we've been fast growing, but that's a very relative term. Uh, I've had, I think I could grow a lot faster if I would stand back and work on the business. And I know Rob has spoke has done a, done a really good job of stepping back. And, it, and that's not an easy thing to do, especially when you're the founder of your own company, you have to, to delegate to other people. And that can be unnerving. Um, and it can be something you're not used to doing. But if you don't do that, you are really not going to be able to grow. So taking that time and reading, studying, going to Vistage meetings or whatever CEO council meetings, that can seem like, oh my God, I can't pull myself away for a day or a half day to go to a seminar to listen to this podcast or to read this book. Um, It might feel unproductive at the time. Uh, So you have to make that investment in, in order to step back and get the big picture and resume those kind of things. So I've, I'm seeing Steve and you're shaking your head a little bit. Can I call on you? Padjavik, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and your business as well. Certainly, thank you. Um, currently we have a residential cleaning, but in a previous life, I had an insurance agency. And what we do is we've taken, we're higher for fit and not for skill. Uh, when in the insurance, we were looking for somebody with experience and it became into, we can't train an old dog new tricks because we were trying to do things differently. Uh, mm-hmm. Similarly, when you mentioned liberal arts, that's how I started education in Ohio. And I came to Florida and none of the credits transferred. This was long ago. And I just started taking classes at the whim. And it was a, a jack of all trades and a master of none. And I think all that really helped in the concept of running a business, trying to lead and working with others. Half of the marketing is psychology. Half of managing is interpersonal relationship and skills Mm -hmm. and all these other attributes lead to a different um, picture and an outcome. Recently at the cleaning, we wanted to do something great for the community. And I said, let's do a blood drive. People wanted to help me, but they weren't uh, totally connected with the nonprofit organization. And then we tried to do an adopt a road. And I said, come on, let's do this. They wanted to help Stephen, but they really didn't care about that part of the road. And as a sustainable business, we wanted to be positive and have these positive outcomes in the community where we reside. So a simple change. Now talk about inefficiency. They would normally give me an idea. I would run with it and present everything on a silver platter and said, let's go. I Mm -hmm. turned, I flipped the script and I said, if you are interested, in what you find, your nonprofit, your charitable organization, go out and pick it, do the research, set up the phone calls, organize everything. Now, nobody was ready for this because they're usually out in the field and not working in an administrative, but it was a different perspective when they took their own idea and used their skills or lack of skills to learn a different way to communicate with directors and to form a program And then everybody supported everybody and we were greatly able to impact the community, even if it's crumb by crumb, but we're gonna add that up to get a loaf of bread. So having the change into generalization, even uh, instilling it in employees by doing that and becoming inefficient because something was prolonged by three weeks, it's still the outcome that we were looking for and to be able to help. And it just so ended up working wonderfully. And that's my little story. Well, it's about getting buy-in, right? And yep. so it can take more time. There's no question. It takes more time to step back and learn to be a good leader and grow your company. It takes more time to have the kind of meetings, like the military meetings, where you go around and you let everybody speak. That is not going to be your 10-minute meeting. That's actually going to say, we're, in a, we're taking this time to cultivate the best possible outcome for our company and best possible decision. So yeah, we're getting, uh, Maria, build trust, build trust, confidence, and ownership. That's right. You have to get your, everybody, every layer of your team involved and engaged. And I think that also helps with retaining top talent is that they feel that their voice has been heard. 
Um, it's a lot easier to be a dictator, but it, I don't think it's going to come out as well. So that's good that you kind of recognize that, Stephen, and, and made that switch. And that probably can apply to things other than just like the volunteer service, right? That can be implied across the board. So I know that Dean Akers is back on. So if you can unmute, I don't know if you heard my question to you, Dean, but I was mainly interested when you've done your interviews, um, whether you had any takeaways on whether most of the C-suite or the leaders that you had interviewed would fall into the generalist mentality and category or more of a specialist. Well, uh, Cheryl, thank you. I had to step away just for a brief moment, but um, <clears throat> yes, uh, I've, I've interviewed a lot of CEOs. I've been the CEO of uh, a number of companies that we've gone to over 100 plus million in revenue and had big exits. In fact, somebody asked me one day, you know, what I do. And I, you know, I've been a highway contractor. I've been a, I had a large chain of tire centers. I, we had the ideal image hair removal centers. We grew to a national brand. We've had a lot of different brands that we've done. From a leadership standpoint, the reason I actually broke away was I'm, I'm working with a particular company right now. I'm in their conference room. That's why I have the blue background. But uh, uh, they, we were talking about leaders and what we've, what, I, what the leaders I've worked with and everything I've found with the Chris Sullivans, the guys that make, you know, these billion dollar companies and stuff like that, is they make going to work fun. And the number one thing that, that, that people, people look for is a, a sense of purpose, uh, uh, even it doesn't matter what generation and having fun. And um, when you look at it and use the Outback, the Outback, you know, everybody la didn't laugh, obviously, because it was very successful. But their mission statement was the just right. People thought that was an Aussie saying. That was actually their mission statement that everybody went out with to make it just right. But I shared one quick story I want to share that about fun. Years ago, and this is held true in every business I've been in. I worked for a concrete pre-stress company in high school. We had all, almost our entire crews were prisoners. So every day they came in a bus. It was the first week I was there, I watched them pitching pennies. And they were pitching pennies and screaming and hollering. And what happened was, is I thought, man, everybody loves to win. So I sat there with all our crews and I'm just a laborer. And I said, hey, let's bet the other three crews that we can tie our steel, pour our concrete and be done quicker than them, which we did, Cheryl. Well, we, we competed a quarter each, no big deal. And these prisoners all got back on a bus and went back to jail every night. About a month later, I'm at my house and the owner of the company's there with my dad. And I was being charged to do this to teach me why I should never be a concrete guy in the summer, because this was in high school. And we had set this thing up. And by the way, that worked. And uh, But I'm sitting there and I overhear the owner of the concrete company, and he goes, Don, I don't know what's going on with my business. The last four weeks, my production is up over 20%. Now, a major construction concrete company making bridge beams, 20% production increase is big money, guys and girls. That's not, oh, we made another $100 today, and they were pouring it in. Do you think any employees... We're going, oh, I need a raise or I need a bonus. No, they were all doing this because we were competing against two. Who? Each other. And who yeah. set the game up? Yeah. We did. Yeah. yeah. And, and there was no money. I mean, we, we traded a quarter for a Coke, you know. And so if you have a company, and I've done it with all my companies, from my hair removal company to my construction company to my tire company, I make the, the game of business fun. I used to give my financials to all 325 employees every month. And somebody goes, well, what if they give them to the competitors? Well, see, I know this as an old guy now. 99% of the people don't know how to read their own financials, much less mine. <laughs> so I didn't care. So I'll well, just that leave does, it. That does making it fun. Idea, though, of you know, you can't get input from people if you don't share the information with them and you don't give them the tools to give you ideas. So, you know, it, you at least empowered people if they, if they wanted to weigh in on something. You gave them the chance to do that. Well, they that. all do. Well, 
important. Oh no, they all do. They all do. I just, I just got this. I did a podcast the other day of hiring employees. A bunch of buddies of mine. They go, it's hard to find new employees today. I said, it's easy to find them. And they go, well, how? I said, you got to engage your teams. And I asked them, Cheryl, have you ever gotten a handwritten note from me? Oh, yes. And I, I, I knew you'd be on this because you always send books, too. You, you're fabulous at sending handwritten notes and books. Okay. How many of us on this call send handwritten notes all the time to our employees' house, to their wives or husbands, and say, thank you for the job Susie did? Smart. Thank you for being a supportive family. Mm-hmm. That might be the best piece of advice of the day, Dean. I'm going I'm to crown you with the best piece of advice. It's, I, I do think those soft skill touches are so critical, and they're and that goes back to inefficiency. Somebody might think, well, why would you take the time to do that? You know, you have other things you need to be doing. But that the return on investment of that note is probably immeasurable. Oh, so. when you're when you're talking about a company doing a hundred million, and if you can get twenty more product, percent production because your team's on behalf, and you sit there and worry about all your marketing crap and all the other stuff you do, it takes me about ten to fifteen minutes a day. And Cheryl, I write a hundred plus handwritten notes every week and have since I was twenty one years old. Wow, I feel less special, but hey, <laughs> hey <laughs> Cheryl. <laughs> I'll leave it I'm alone there. I'm just kidding. Yeah, Mark, do we have a time for another question, or we need to wrap it up? Because I think we got a couple more minutes. If you had one more, uh, sort yeah. Of well, if um, if Harry from Net Director is still on the line, I was interested in asking him a question. Are you on with us, Harry? He might have gotten pulled away. I think he was on there, but Harry has. Um, has a cloud-based data exchange company. And it's actually interesting because it, it connects the financial services and healthcare industries and, and their techno technology, their data, so that all can speak to each other through an API. And, and it's a little like, you know, what they're saying here is a, you want to you want to share and have diverse ideas and everybody in a in less hierarchy and more ability to communicate effectively with each other. So when I think about the the visual of how he displays what their company can do, it's, it's kind of the visual of creating a, a little bit of flatter organization um, and communicating more effectively for the most optimal outcomes. So I hope if any of you didn't get a chance to, to read this book, uh, it is on audio. I, I usually end up buying the hardback after I listen to the audio version because I want to highlight, I want to post it note. So, you know, it gets all marked up with different, different things. Um, it's just kind of my, my way. I just end up wanting to see it actually in print again. Um, but audiobooks and podcasts are such a great opportunity to think through it. And I think if you enjoyed this book, if you did read it, um, Outliers um, by um, Malcolm Gladwell that does have the 10,000 hours is similarly compelling along these same lines. And then there is one other um, article that I think is compelling uh, that touches on these same topics, which is a 2020 Harvard professor article. And I, I can't remember the name. Um, well, I can remember the name, but it's very long. It's at least probably 40 characters, just the name. So I'm not gonna try to say it, but um, this article talks about these same types of concepts. And the, I thought the point that he makes is in this type of day and age when we have, quote, the rapid advancement of technology combined with increased uncertainty is making the most important career logic of the past counterproductive going forward. So the past concept of specialization in the modern world with everything changing so fast, I mean, you didn't have blockchain jobs several years ago. I mean, this is cryptocurrency. All of these types of industry changes in the, in the movement, and the speed in which we have to uh, adapt, it's this adaptability that, in my opinion, and I'll make this my closing statement about this, is I think the number one aspect of being a generalist is adaptability. And in today's day and age and in today's businesses, and really in your personal life, look what happened in COVID last year. You have to be able to adapt, and adaptability comes from 
feeling comfortable and confident navigating a lot of different ideas and a different concepts. And so that means being open to a broader viewpoint about your, even your own life and taking those forks in the road and circling back to the ones that you didn't get to take maybe at a certain time. So I've had a pleasure. I'll let you wrap it up, Mark. I'm sure you have your, your closing statement <laughs> that you put at the end of all each of these. Um, well, just thank you so much, Cheryl. Really appreciate it. I know I got something out of that, especially as you mentioned at the end, being nimble and flexible. And um, that was really an informative discussion. Our next book club is September 1st. So be on the lookout for information on that. And Cheryl, thank you again for being here. We really appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you all. Good to meet you.